35 killed in Israeli strikes on Rafah. Tornado tears through central U.S., leaving at least 15 dead. Good afternoon and salam alaykum Madani. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching World Today with me, Otto Othman. Israeli strikes on a center for displaced residents killed at least 35 people and left dozens injured. The victims of the massacre near the southern city of Rafah were mostly women and children. The strikes hit a center run by the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees near Rafah, branding it a horrific massacre. Israel's army said it was aware of reports indicating that as a result of the strikes and fire that was ignited, several civilians in the area were harmed. Fighting has recently centered on Rafah, where Israel's military launched a ground operation in early May, despite widespread international opposition over concerns for civilians sheltering in the area. The Palestinian Red Crescent said its ambulance crews transported a large number of people killed and injured in the Rafah strikes. The Palestinian presidency in the West Bank called it a heinous massacre, accusing Israel forces of deliberately targeting the tents of displaced people. Meanwhile, Amnesty International has urged the International Criminal Court to investigate as war crimes three their recent Israeli strikes that killed 44 Palestinian civilians, including 32 children. Amnesty said three Israeli strikes, one on the Al-Ghazi refugee camp in central Gaza on April 16th, and two on Rafah in southern Gaza on 19th and 20th April are further evidence of a broader pattern of war crimes committed by the Israeli military in Gaza. Senior Director at Amnesty Erika Guevara Rosas said the cases documented illustrate a clear pattern of attacks over the past seven months in which the Israeli military have flaunted international law, killing Palestinian civilians with total impunity and displacing a callous disregard for human lives. The rights organization has conducted its own investigation into the strikes, interviewing 17 survivors and witnesses, and visiting a hospital where the wounded were being treated. In all three cases, Amnesty did not find any evidence that there had been any military targets in or around the locations targeted by Israeli forces. Recognizing the state of Palestine is justice for the Palestinian people and the best guarantee of security for Israel. Welcoming Spain's move the, with Norway and Ireland to recognize the Palestinian state on Tuesday, Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Mustafa expressed hope that every country in Europe would implement the same measure. Spain's Foreign Minister Jose Manuel Alvarez and Mohamed Mustafa spoke side by side in Brussels, where the Palestinian leader was also meeting EU Foreign Policy Chief Josep Borrell and Norwegian Foreign Minister Espen Bath Eide. They hope that the steps towards a long, elusive two state solution will build foundations for West Asia peace. Recognition is the right thing to do now. Recognition doesn't mean the end of everything. It's the beginning of a new phase. We will act responsibly as a state recognized by many countries to work diligently towards the realization of peace between us and our neighbors. So a majority of UN member countries recognize Palestinian statehood. European countries are split on the issue. Spain, Norway and Italy will join EU nations, Bulgaria, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Sweden in recognizing the state of Palestine. Twelve people were injured during turbulence on a Qatar Airways flight from Doha to Ireland that landed safely yesterday. The incident comes a week after a passenger died and dozens were injured when a Singapore Airlines flight from London hit severe turbulence and was diverted to Bangkok. Six passengers and six crew members suffered injuries in the latest incident when Qatar Airways flight QR-017 endured turbulence over Turkey. 
The flight landed as scheduled shortly before 1 p.m. local time. Upon landing, the aircraft was met by emergency services including airport police and fire and rescue department. Qatar Airways said the injuries sustained were minor and that the incident is now subject to an internal investigation. A British man died and more than 100 people were injured when Singapore Airlines flight SQ321 endured extreme turbulence last Tuesday, forcing the plane to make an emergency landing in Bangkok. Air safety experts say that passengers are often too casual about wearing seat belts, leaving them at risk if the plane hits unexpected turbulence. Scientists also warn that so-called clear air turbulence, which is invisible to radar, is getting worse because of climate change. Now, at least 15 people were killed across the central United States as tornadoes and other extreme storms hit several states, including Texas, Arkansas and Oklahoma. Rescue efforts were ongoing and hundreds of thousands of customers were without power after the storms struck the Southern Plains region beginning late Saturday. In Texas, Cook County Sheriff Ray Sappington said that at least seven people were dead after a tornado ripped through the Valley View area north of Dallas. The twister destroyed homes and a gas station and overturned vehicles on an interstate highway. In Oklahoma, at least two people were dead after a tornado hit Myers County late Saturday, while in Arkansas, five people were killed in storms in the early hours of Sunday. Another death was reported in Louisville, Kentucky. As far north as Indiana, the start of the Indianapolis 500 was delayed for several hours due to storms in the area, with fans asked to exit the bleachers and seek shelter. As the storm system moved across the country, nearly 490,000 customers were without power in states, stretching from Texas up to Kansas and east to Ohio and Kentucky. Tornado alerts were still active in several places. Over in Bangladesh, an intense cyclone smashed into the low-lying coast of the country, with nearly a million people fleeing inland for concrete storm shelters away from howling gales and crashing waves. Bangladesh Meteorological Department said it recorded maximum wind speeds of 90 kilometers per hour, but the wind speed may pick up more pace. Senior weather official Muhammad Abdul Kalam Malik said the cyclone could unleash a storm surge of up to four meters above normal astronomical tide, which can be dangerous. Authorities have raised the danger signal to its highest level. Most of Bangladesh's coastal areas are a meter or two above sea level, and high storm surges can devastate villages. At least 800,000 Bangladeshis fled their coastal villages, while more than 50,000 people in India also moved inland from the vast Sundarbans mangrove forest where the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna rivers meet the sea. Cyclones have killed hundreds of thousands of people in Bangladesh in recent decades, but the number of superstorms hitting its densely populated coast has increased sharply from one a year to as many as three due to the impact of climate change. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol and Chinese Premier Lee Kiang agreed to launch a diplomatic and security dialogue and resume talks on a free trade agreement. Yoon and Lee met in Seoul a day before a summit with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, the first three-way talks by the three Asian neighbors in more than four years. Yun told Lee that South Korea and China should work together not only to promote shared interests based on mutual respect, but also on regional and global issues to tackle common challenges. Yun asked China to play a greater role as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, especially as North Korea continues to develop nuclear missiles and boost military cooperation with Russia. Li told Yun their countries should oppose turning economic and trade issues into political or security issues and should work to maintain stable supply chains. 
Li said China is ready to strengthen cooperation in high end manufacturing, new energy, artificial intelligence, biomedicine, and other fields. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Sunday arrived in Uzbekistan for a two day visit. Putin was greeted at the Tashkent airport by his Uzbek counterpart, Shavkat Marziyoyev. The two leaders later visited Park New Uzbekistan, where Putin laid wreath to the independence monument. According to the Kremlin press service, during the talks, both leaders will discuss current state of affairs and prospects for further development of Russian-Uzbek relations of strategic partnership and alliance, as well as exchange their views on current regional issues. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov was quoted telling Russian television that Russia was open to broader cooperation on gas supplies with Uzbekistan, saying the possibilities are very extensive. This is the second Putin's foreign trip after he was officially sworn in for his new term as Russian president on May 7th. On 15th to May 16th, he also visited China and met with Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping. The Kremlin leader has traveled abroad only infrequently since the start of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. French President Emmanuel Macron and German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier visited a giant football pitch in front of the Brandenburg Gate on Sunday, built for the Euro 2024 tournament. Steinmeier and Macron exchanged jerseys before Macron continued to walk through Brandenburg Gate with Berlin's mayor Kai Wagner and afterwards signing the Golden Book of Germany's capital. Macron landed in Germany on Sunday for a three-day state visit followed by a bilateral cabinet meeting as the European Union's two biggest powers seek to show unity ahead of next month's EU parliamentary elections. Macron's trip to the capital Berlin, Dresden in the east and Munster in the west is the first French presidential state visit to Germany in 24 years. The visit will be watched as a checkup on the health of the German-French relationship that drives EU policy making at a time of major challenges for Europe from the Ukraine war to the possible election of Donald Trump as United States President in November. Coming up next, rescue efforts ongoing in Papua New Guinea province flattened by landslide. Now, rescue efforts continued in a remote village of Papua New Guinea's Enya province, which has left flattened by Friday's devastating landslide through emergency teams had been struggling to reach the affected site, with road access being largely blocked off. The landslide struck in the early hours on Friday while many people were asleep at home. The disaster is feared to have killed hundreds, though the official number of casualties has yet to be announced. Local media reported that more than 300 people were thought to have been buried by the landslide, which has leveled dozens of homes in the remote village, located some 600 kilometers north of the capital, Port Moresby. The government had sent out a dedicated natural disaster team alongside healthcare workers and police to the location of the landslide, but rescuers were encountering difficulties due to the area's tough terrain. The Anga provincial government had also dispatched an assessment team to provide guidance during the ongoing rescue operation, while the affected region and other highland provinces were on high alert as the threat of more landslides looms large amid the country's continuing wet season. In a related development, a United Nations official said more than 670 people are believed to have died after the massive landslide in Papua New Guinea as aid workers and villagers braved perilous conditions in their search for survivors. UN Migration Agency representative Serhan Akhtoprak said there are an estimated 150-plus houses now buried. He added, the situation is terrible with the land still sliding, noting that the water is running and this is creating a massive risk for everyone involved. Aid agencies estimated that more than 1,000 people have been displaced by the catastrophe, with food gardens and water supplies almost completely wiped out. 
According to the World Bank, Papua New Guinea has one of the wettest climates in the world, with the heaviest downpours concentrated in the country's humid highland interior. Research has found shifting rainfall patterns linked to climate change could exacerbate the risk of landslides. This year has seen intense rainfall and flooding across Papua New Guinea. Lithuania's President Gitanas Nosieda won a re-election by a landslide in a vote marked by defense concerns over neighboring Russia. The court published by the Electoral Commission showed that Nosieda won 74.6% of votes with 90% of ballots counted after polls closed in the second round vote. His opponent, Prime Minister Ingrida Simonite, won 23.8% of the vote and congratulated Nuseda in comments to reporters. The Lithuanian president steers defense and foreign policy, attending EU and NATO summits, but must consult with the government and parliament on appointing the most senior officials. While the candidates agree on defense, they share diverging views on Lithuania's relations with China, which have been strained for years over Taiwan. Both candidates agree that the NATO and EU member of 2.8 million people should boost defense spending to counter the perceived threat from Russia, and to that end, the government recently proposed a tax increase. Lithuania is a significant donor to Ukraine, which has been battling Russia since the 2022 invasion. Vilnius fears it could be next in the crosshairs if Moscow were to win its war against Ukraine. Seven more mobile force units will soon arrive as reinforcements in New Caledonia, while a state of emergency would end as planned in a French Pacific territory on Tuesday morning local time. At least seven people have been killed, hundreds arrested, and large numbers of buildings and cars destroyed in a fortnight of upheaval triggered by a contested electoral reform and fueled by sharp economic disparities between the indigenous Kanak population and people of European background. Police shot dead a man on Friday evening, a day after French President Emmanuel Macron visited to try to calm tensions. The arrival of an additional 480 gendarmes will bring the number of French security forces in the Pacific Territory to some 3,500. Macron's decision to not renew the state of emergency illustrates Paris' desire to start the process of de-escalation and re-establish conditions for dialogue. Macron said that the lifting of the roadblocks is the necessary condition for the opening of concrete and serious negotiations. No announcement, however, was made on a night curfew imposed by local authorities in New Caledonia. The operator of Numea International Airport has announced it will remain closed until 2nd June. Thousands of Armenians staged an anti-government protest demanding Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan's resignation over territorial concessions to arc foe neighbor Azerbaijan. Protests erupted in the Caucasus nation last month after the government agreed to hand over to Baku territory it had controlled since the 1990s. The ceded area is strategically important for landlocked Armenia because it controls sections of a vital highway to Georgia. Armenian presidents of nearby settlements say the move cuts them off from the rest of the country and accuse Pashinyan of giving away territory without getting anything in return. Several thousand people flooded Yerevan's Central Republic Square in the French protest, spearheaded by charismatic Archbishop Bagrat Gastanyan, a church leader from the Tavush region where villages were handed over to Azerbaijan. Pashinyan defended the territorial concessions as aimed at securing peace with Baku. However, they sparked weeks of protests and demonstrators blocked major roads in an attempt to force him to change course. Still to come in sports, Bayern Leverkusen clinches German double to drown out Europa final sorrows.
Manchester City saw grey skies turn to blue on Sunday as they celebrated a record fourth successive Premier League title with fans pouring into the streets of the city to cheer on their heroes once again. City proved their mettle by ending the title race in style with a 3-1 win over West Ham United on the final day of the season to finish on 91 points to more than Arsenal and become the first English club to win four league titles in a row. Players and staff waved to fans as confetti rained down and blue smoke flares were lit along the route of the open-top bus, just hours after thousands of people took part in the Great Manchester Run. Neither the weather nor the anti-climax of the ceremony taking place the day after the FA Cup final defeat by arch rivals Manchester United 2-1 could dampen the spirits as flags, bananas and even a blow-up Jack Grealish dummy were held aloft in triumph. Having won the treble last year, Pep Guardiola's side added the Super Cup and Club World Cup to their haul this season along with the league title. The Spanish manager, named Premier League Manager of the Year, smiled before the fans and was thrilled with these celebrations despite taking the blame for his side missing out on a second successive domestic double. Bayer Leverkusen were excited to see their team return home on Sunday after securing the German double following their 1-0 German Cup win against second division team FC Kaiserslautern on the evening before. Leverkusen streets were covered in red as Xavi Alonso and his team drove in open buses towards the stadium for the big celebration. Alonso on Saturday called it a dream season after Bayer Leverkusen over the weekend added the German Cup to their Bundesliga win. Leverkusen lost only one of 53 matches across all competitions this season. Their only defeat coming in Wednesday's Europa League final against Atalanta. They bounced back on Saturday, however, and despite playing with 10 men for more than half the game, they snatched the win courtesy of Glenn Isaka's 16th minute goal. Prior to this season's Bundesliga title, Leverkusen's last trophy was the 1993 German Cup. Alonso said that the team had little time to review their first defeat of the season, but they had already put the loss behind them, having clinched the double. Barcelona ended the season with a 2-1 victory at Sevilla in La Liga on Sunday, making departing coach Xavi Hernandez's farewell bittersweet after a trophyless season in which they finished 10 points behind champions Real Madrid. The final game for Xavi, who was sacked on Friday, leaves Barca second after a disappointing campaign. They lost the Spanish Super Cup final to Real Madrid, were knocked out of the Copa del Rey by Atletico Bilbao in the quarterfinals and eliminated from the Champions League by Paris Saint-Germain, also in the last eight. Xavi, 44, who joined Barca on a three-year deal when Dutchman Ronald Koeman left in 2021, led the Catalan Giants to their 27th league title last season. He compiled 90 wins, 23 draws and 29 defeats in 142 games in charge but was fired on Friday. Barcelona thanked Xavi for his work as coach, which adds to his unmatchable career as a player and a captain of the first team and wish him all the best in the future. German coach Hansi Flick is expected to be appointed as Xavi's successor. Barca B-team coach Rafa Marquez and outgoing Bayer Munich boss Thomas Tuchel were also considered but a source said negotiations with Flick's camp were now advanced. In tennis, seasoned campaigners Caroline Garcia and Richard Gasquet kept French Open hopes alive at Roland Garros with battling victories on Sunday. Garcia, the 21st seed, shook off a sluggish start during which she dropped the open set to eventually get past German Eva Lee's 4 6 7 5 6 2 under the roof of Philippe Cartier. Up next for the 2022 WTA Finals champion, 
who has lost in the second round in her last three French Open appearances, is American Sofia Kenin. At 37 and in the twilight of his career, Gasquet is not the man that most fans will be pining their hopes on of ending the nation's wait for a first homegrown champion since Yannick Noah's triumph in 1983. But in his 21st Roland Garros main draw appearance that equaled Valenciano Lopez's open-era record, the silky gasket showed plenty of steel to beat Croatia Borna Koric 7-6-7-6-6-4 to huge cheers from Suzanne Langlin crowd. Backed by a ruckus crowd on Simona Mathieu court, Corentin Motet also advanced, overcoming Italian open runner-up and 16th seed Nicolas Jerry 6-2-6-1-3-6-6 love. Ducati's reigning champion Francesco Bagnaia won the Catalonia Grand Prix on Sunday to close the gap on championship leader Jorge Martin, who finished second, while Cassini Ducati's Marc Marquez was third despite starting 14th on the grid. Marquez repeated his heroics from Saturday's sprint when he finished in an astonishing second from 14th, keeping Polister Alex Espargaro at bay until the checkered flag and finished five hundredths of a second ahead to take third. Banyaya had crashed on the final lap of the sprint when he was leading, but Sunday's victory, his third of the season, was redemption for the Italian, who is now 39 points behind Martin. Just as in Saturday's sprint, Banyaya and Pedro Acosta moved up to first and second at the start, while sprint winner Espargaro was pushed down to fifth in his final home race. Martin also had a blistering start to go from seventh on the grid to third, with Red Bull KTM's Brad Binder slotting in behind him. With three straight podiums, Marquez is now third in the championship, two points behind Banyaya. Slovenian Stade Pogacar emphatically won the Giro d'Italia on his debut when he retained his unassailable overall lead after Sunday's 21st and final stage in Rome, winning by the biggest overall margin since 1965. Now, the 25-year-old UAE Team Emirates rider had been in the leader's pink jersey since winning stage two, the first of his six-stage successes. He finished Sunday's ceremonial 125-kilometer flat run safely in the bunch as Tim Marlier won the stage. Marlier from Sumdal Quickstep outsprinted Italy's Jonathan Milan from Team Little Trek as the Belgian won his third stage. Milan had made his way back to the front for the bunch sprint after crashing on the last lap around the Eternal City. Bogachar finished 9 minutes and 56 seconds ahead of Colombia's Daniel Martinez of Bora Heinz Groha, with last year's runner up, Geriant Thomas of Wales from Ineos Grandiers, of further 28 seconds behind the third in overall standings. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the pink jersey is uh, is really special, uh, crazy, crazy experience, and uh, all the fans was uh, unbelievably good. So yeah, I'm, um, yeah, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> Now that's it for World Today this time around. In our top story, 35 killed in Israeli strikes on Rafah, which victims mostly women and children. I'm Otto Othman from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Thanks for watching and have a pleasant day ahead.